We're here with Michael Schallenberg from the Breakthrough Institute. Thank you very much for joining us and being united this year. Thanks for having me. So what is new economic thinking to you? Well, I think new econo what's interesting about the new economic thinking is I think it's bringing together a bunch of big thinkers that have traditionally been dealt with separately. So um, the two big thinkers and the two big uh, traditions of thought that I see here are Keynesian economics and Schumpeterian economics. Schumpeter for a long time, I think, was um, not taken seriously by political progressives, the political left. I think that Schumpeter is now becoming really one of the most dominant figures on the political left in the United States um, and I think in parts of Europe. Um, just a real appreciation of the importance of technological innovation to economic growth. So how does your personal background take you to innovation and more specifically about environmentalism and conservation? Well, we come to Schumpeter and the idea of creative destruction through an environmental lens. So when you look at the biggest factors in terms of how humans both save and destroy nature is through technology. So one of the most important things that humans ever did to save the environment was to move away from using wood as fuel. 75% um, of deforestation occurred uh, before the Industrial Revolution. And so when you move to modern energy, mostly it was coal, um, you save your forests, um, you, know, you allow wildlife to come back. And obviously that same transition was the driver of the first big wave of economic growth as we left the agricultural period. Um, and, and then we just kind of keep seeing it happening. Uh, you see in energy transitions, uh, what are often called, um, uh, you know, are often part of chondriative waves, um, you know, part of that Schumpeterian process. So right now in the United States, we're seeing a transition from coal to natural gas that is largely the result of a technological revolution in extracting gas from shale, which is a rock about a mile underground. And speaking of shale, which is this phenomenon that's been described as a North American revolution because of its impact on Canada, recent reforms in Mexico, you come from a, from a different perspective. You've produced one of the first, if not the first, history of the shale uh, revolution. So how does, how does the history inform where we are in the process now? Well, I think we're still very early in, in, in getting gas out of shale. Um, it's a technology that spread really quickly in the United States for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, it, China's pursuing it very rapidly. Um, I don't think it'll spread as quickly in other countries as it did here. Um, obviously, our interest in it was just simply, at first, environmental. Um, coal is the most carbon-intensive fossil fuel. If you want to deal with climate change, you basically need to move everybody away from coal towards cleaner sources of energy. Natural gas produces about half the carbon emissions as coal, has some other problems, um, methane emissions, certainly fracking has um, environmental consequences. Um, but natural gas as a whole is better than coal on basically every environmental measure. So we wanted to understand, well, how did we get all this cheap natural gas out of the ground? And the story that was being told when we first looked into it um, in 2011 is that this was just sort of came from the private sector. The government had nothing to do with it. In fact, I was, uh, uh, we talked to everybody, uh, including very conservative Republicans, libertarians, and I had, it actually started as a taunt. I, a climate skeptic who we talk with and argue with um, emailed me an article about the shell gas revolution and said, I suppose Breakthrough Institute is going to claim that this came from the government as well. So we took that as a personal challenge and, uh, and all we did was at first we just Googled Department of Energy um, and shale. And sure enough, we discovered there had been 40 years of involvement by the federal government in trying to get gas out of shale. So the history itself um, goes back even longer. We, you know, uh, gas drill drillers always knew there was gas in, the, in shale, but they didn't think there was very much and they didn't know how to get it out of the shale um, because it's not in reservoirs. It's, in, it's, it's, just, it's diffused in the rock itself. Um, and so after, when, when we had an energy crisis in the early 70s, the federal government through the Department of Energy um, and the Bureau of Mines uh, started to demonstrate that there was a lot of shale, a lot of, sorry, a lot of natural gas in those shales, and then really over the next several decades worked with the private sector to figure out ways to get it out. What do you think were the most efficient ways in which the Department of Energy helped uh, foster what we now call a revolution, but as you can see in your research, has come, been coming since the 70s or since the first oil shock? Well, there's several things. That, so the first thing to understand about sh uh, shale fracking is there's actually three technologies at work. Everyone pays attention to the fracking. Um, um, but really, there's three important technologies. The first is horizontal drilling or directional drilling um, because you need to go move through the, the shale um, horizontally. Mm -hmm. um, the second, obviously, is fracking itself, um, something that the US had been uh, funding demonstration projects on since the 50s. 
And then the third is um, maybe the most interesting and the least understood, and that's um, underground mapping. They called it micro-seismic mapping. The technology actually came out, as a lot of these technologies do, out of World War II, out of radar, mm -hmm. um, submarine uh, navigation, and then it was used in underground nuclear testing. Um, so what happened is that they were struggling to figure out how to uh, uh, m both make and, and align the drilling in the shale with where the cracks were. So they needed to be able to see what was happening underground. And a really critical moment came when finally Mitchell Energy, which was the private sector pioneer of shale fracking, uh, got in touch with the Department of Energy and said, we need your help. Can you send up some of your guys from Sandia National Labs? They sent them up and they basically applied all these technologies that had been used um, also um, uh, to detect um, uh, instability in coal mines. Um, and the Department of Energy was trying to avoid coal mine collapses. And so they were uh, wanting to better map what was happening underground. Um, anyway, that's a compressed version of it. A lot more happened, but, but it was essentially that collaboration between this private sector and the public sector, um, the national labs. Um, and, I, and so you asked sort of what was important about it. I think what was important was to have a, a really strong private sector actor in the form of George Mitchell, who was tenacious, deserves a huge amount of credit. Um, sometimes people ask us, you know, who do you give more credit for, the government or the private sector? It's really the wrong question because you can't imagine, it would not have happened without both private and public sector actors. It's interesting that you're that you're describing how it also came from uh, so many other technologies in the second half of the 20th century, from investment in defense and out of the war in a way. It, it's it, it's fascinating stuff. I mean, these are all um, uh, these are we one of the things that's come out of our work is that we've discovered that similar technologies that were used for underground mapping that came from submarines and mm -hmm. other things are now being used uh, for self-driving cars. Right. So robot vehicles, these are all um, ways of controlling your territory. So you can see why it's a military is always concerned about having really good visibility in your territory, really understanding landscapes, um, obviously the, the, the skies, um, the oceans. Um, so really, it really just comes out of naturally out of those those military applications. And it's, it's just been exciting to see, you know, these really circuitous paths that these technologies have taken over the last several decades. Speaking to a geologist, I remember him saying that, you know, the, the God didn't stop the formations of the border. So right. this, in a way, when, in the context of NAFTA, Canada and Mexico are both really going to, ben to benefit from the development of these technologies that were pioneered in the United States. Do you see a, an explosion in shale south of the border? You know, it's hard to say. Um, you know, there was a bunch of other factors that allowed for shale fracking to really take off in the United States. I think our formations were a little bit simpler than the formations, for example, that they have in China. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, um, you know, um, I'm not as familiar with the formations that they have um, in Latin America. Um, you know, we also had a very developed oil and gas industry. Um, we had really strong property rights uh, for, um, which has been a conservative talking point, but they're, they're right on it. Um, you know, you had, um, you know, landowners can lease their land and they control their underground assets, which is just not the case in, in a lot of countries, right. certainly not in Europe. So taking a step back from the technologies yeah. and the history, do you think that this, it's definitely not public perception that um, shale and fracking would be cleaner than what it's replacing? Right. Why do you think that is? Um, there are a, a number of reasons why uh, there has been a, a, a popular backlash against shale fracking. I think there's really two big things. Um, the first is that um, natural gas, the expansion of natural gas development has had big impacts on rural communities. It's the industrialization of the countryside. So if you have a nice country home or you live in the country because you want peace and quiet, suddenly there's a bunch of heavy trucks going by, there's compressors that make noise. Um, it's just disruptive and often unpleasant. So I think it's quite understandable that some communities have opposed it. Um, I think the other thing is just um, there is a strong environmental movement that's very concerned about climate change. And that movement has tended to think that we would be able to go right from coal to solar panels and to wind farms. Um, well, in truth, the wind farms are incredibly opposed by local communities. In fact, the movie that Matt Damon was in last year called Promised Land, mm -hmm. which is an attack on natural gas fracking, was actually first originally written about a wind farm. Um, so um, now everyone kind of goes, well, solar, you know, it could have replaced it. But solar last year provided less than 0.2% of our electricity, remains very expensive, and obviously it's intermittent. But I think there's just a set of folks that have hoped that we would be able to move away from all fossil fuels entirely. Um, I would say a, a smaller factor 
that is probably a part of the second is just I think there's just a lot of misunderstandings. There are, um, um, you know, pollution issues associated with natural gas, um, and they and they create new pollution problems in new places. Um, so even if, for example, gas is better than coal mining, which it is at every at every metric, um, it still is introducing new industrial activity and new pollution into areas where you didn't have it before. Um, so I think that. Um, so all you think that there's a disassociation of the aggregate level of society as a whole and the specific pain in certain areas that yes. would have not otherwise seen pollution or yep. heavy trucks or compressors. Yep. Yeah, and, and I think there are ideological differences. So I'm from the state of Colorado, which has a very huge, is booming in terms of natural gas. Most of the gas, overwhelmingly, most of the gas development is happening in, in my, actually near my hometown of Greeley, Colorado. It's a conservative town. They love the oil and gas development there. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Boulder, which is sort of the Berkeley of Colorado, um, uh, there's you know widespread opposition to it. So I think it is, it's not just, it's not like the people in Greeley don't care about the you know about all the hassles, but I think they're just more ideologically inclined to support economic development over environmental protection. I remember seeing a great chart that sort of mapped the the gains of employment in the United States state by state basis, and you know the areas where where there has been a, an energy revolution were just so far ahead from other areas, and that has political implications. Do you think that? That as we approach, you know, the next the midterms and the next presidential elections, you think people are going to change their perception to how they see shale, and you know, the, 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 there are very loud environmental groups, but maybe they're not seeing all the evidence in this right. case, right? Well, yeah, I mean, we we were anti natural gas as well, right? <laughs> uh, and changed our minds on it after we really spent some time looking well, at it. Well, that's new economic thinking. I mean, trying to change the, yes. the you know, yeah, be yeah. open to changing your mind. Yeah, and part of it was precisely that we, you know, we, we started losing confidence that renewables would be really easy to scale up. Right, um, wasn't happening. And there's, why do there's, you think? Why do you think? Do you think this is just a cost issue in terms of solar, or there are some key technologies that are there in the case of gas, natural gas, and shale that are not there in the case of, of uh, wind farms and or solar? Well, so you, it's important to understand the physics of energy a little bit. So. Um, there's really three big, there's really, you know, four big forms of renewable energy. Wood burning, which is terrible for the environment. Mm -hmm. Hydroelectric dams, which have, you know, zero pollution over time. There is some pollution in the initial stages, um, but is incredibly devastating to river ecosystems. That's why dams were, have been opposed by environmental groups for 40 years. Right. Um, then there's uh, solar and wind. And the problem with all renewable energy sources is that you have to use a lot of nature a lot of those re so-called renewable resources in order to produce very much energy. So the problem with, with wind is that you have to, to, in order to get very much electricity out of wind farms, you have to spread wind turbines over a vast area and they're intermittent. So you don't, if the wind's not blowing, you don't get electricity. Right. Similarly with solar, where, where solar is more economical is when you have these huge solar farms like we just built in the Mojave Desert. You know, I, I was in favor of those solar farms, but they are massive farms that, that do disrupt the ecosystems that they're a part of. Um, so there's no free lunch on any energy source. Um, I, I think what I was going to say, one thing I was going to say in terms of the economic impact is that, you know, the, the gas revolution changed how we sort of think about how to deal with climate change in an important sense. It's a Schumpeterian revolution. Um, I think before, and this gets to the prior question around Keynes, mm -hmm. um, our initial idea 10 years ago was, was that we were gonna save the world from climate change through a kind of Keynesian green jobs program right. where we would pay people to install solar panels. Um, we no longer think that that's the right model. It, the real model is gonna look much more like a Schumpeterian model where a revolutionary technology or process, in the case of, of the shale gas processes, um, uh, disrupt the incumbent, which in this case was coal. Right. Um, the other thing, incredible, very little remarked upon is that the assumption among everybody, liberals and conservatives for the last 20, 30 years, has been that to deal with climate change, there's gonna be some economic cost. You're gonna to have to pay something. Mm -hmm. Well, in the case of shale gas, um, uh, natural gas uh, over the last five years has reduced coal's share of the electricity sector from 50 to 37% while contributing to the US economy $100 billion a year in the form of lower energy prices. Well, that wasn't a cost, that was a net so, benefit. So the creative destruction is 
positive for GDP growth. It's clearly positive for GDP growth. I would go even further and say I don't think President Obama would have been reelected if it hadn't been for the shale gas revolution. It came in in 2007, just as he was coming into office. Mm -hmm. It acted as a sort of a hidden second stimulus. That's right. So between 2007 and 2012, it contributed $500 billion to the economy with huge job growth in Ohio. Yeah. Um, and the key battleground states that Obama had to win in order to be reelected. Right. So, um, you know, and I think that it is changing. I mean, I think you're seeing uh, President Obama came out very forcefully as part of his climate speech, um, embracing the transition from coal to gas. I mean, anybody that kind of really takes a hard look at this at a policy perspective just has a hard time saying, no, we shouldn't transition from coal to gas. We should, we should insist on transitioning right from coal to solar when there's just no way you could get the, the amount of emissions reductions that we've gotten from that coal to gas transition. Have you done any research on the countries that have chosen to push solar through subsidies and sort of like Germany or Spain that for a long time were encouraging their citizens to install their own uh, production facilities? And we have. Um, the, obviously, the biggest country is Germany. Yeah. And uh, I believe in 2012, Germany got 5% of its electricity from solar. Um, and the problem here is the intermittency. So there are days, there were days, like very sunny um, days, usually weekend days in 2012, where Germany got 50% of its electricity from solar. And that sounds great, except for when you consider that there's some days when it doesn't get any electricity from solar. And what it happens is it ends up wrecking havoc on the grid and being able to manage the grid. Because if, if, the, if the, you know, if, if, you know if cloud cover comes yeah, yeah. and there's no longer, you have to ramp up your gas plants your natural gas plants, um, harder to ramp up a coal plant, for example, and you just turn nat natural gas up like you can on your stove, um, and then you get a huge energy penalty. So that's the reason that, you know, you know that and Germany's decision to move away from nuclear mm -hmm. has been the reason why Germans, um, Germany's emissions have actually been going up in recent years, and they've been turning back to coal. Um, so that's a, that's a de-development. Yeah, I think you're moving backwards yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, I'm all for um, uh, innovation on solar. Right. Um, there has been radical innovation. Um, on, I wouldn't say maybe I, I wouldn't say, actually let me take that back. There has been significant innovation on solar. I don't know if I would call it radical, Got it. Um, uh, but costs have come down dramatically, yeah. mostly because the Chinese built huge factories to produce it. Right, and they've massively brought down the costs of, of actually producing the panels. They have, right. yeah. So a lot of the costs still remain in dealing with the intermittency and in the. So as you look forward and you try to bring together your expertise in the history. And and you know these technologies as, as well as a comparative effort on you know what other potential sources are there. How do you imagine the grid in 20 years? Like how do you think the grid will look like? Well, one of the things that Breakthrough Institute is doing right now is that we are in the process of reimagining what green growth is, and that starts with this case study that we've done on shale gas. Mm -hmm. We're also going to do a workshop on past energy transitions so that we can understand what the future energy transition, what the characteristics of it are. One of them we know is that the new energy technologies have to be cheaper and better than the incumbents. Right. If they're not cheaper and better, then the societies aren't going to move to them. Mm -hmm. And then the third part, though, is a really a different vision of green growth that I think would move away from this Keynesian vision of green growth is just sort of subsidies for workers. It's mm -hmm. actually a vision of green growth that embraces enhanced labor productivity um, from technological change as well as enhanced resource productivity. So when you, so the example, the classic example, of course, of the move from wood to coal, mm -hmm. driven largely by the steam engine, largely pulled in by railroads um, and manufacturing, both increased labor productivity and it increased labor, the resource productivity. So we're very interested in reconceptualizing green growth um, in ways that are more constant, I think, with what has actually happened in, in the course of human history. Great. And final, last question. Do you think, um, as, do you think there's a, any way to make this debate a little bit less partisan in America and more about the actual technology and the actual innovations? Definitely. I think that just talk, first of all, most conservatives favor both natural gas and nuclear. Um, uh, and um, even if most liberals um, are anti-nuclear and more tepid, I would say, on natural gas. Good um, word. Um, um, so, you know, one thing is, yeah, as soon as you start talking to conservatives about supporting um, you know, natural gas to replace coal. Once you start talking to conservatives about developing a next generation of nuclear that's safer, that's cheaper, um, you get a lot of support for a, a clean energy agenda that you don't get if you just focus on solar panels and wind farms. Got it. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being on it. Great. Thank you.